Okay, so you're very welcome to the second uh, webinar in the Pig Development Department series. Um, today we're looking at biosecurity and its effect on antimicrobial usage and profitability. Uh, our guest speaker today is Jeroen de Wolf, uh, Professor Jeroen de Wolf from Ghent University in Belgium. Um, Jeroen is a vet by trade and graduated a number of years ago from Ghent University, has done postgrad work with the University of Utrecht. He's currently professor of veterinary epidemiology and heads the veterinary epidemiology unit in the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine in Ghent University. He has a number of PhD students working in areas of antimicrobial usage, biosecurity, etc. Um, he's co-author of over 300 uh, A1 publications, has authored a number of books in the areas of biosecurity and antimicrobial usage, antimicrobial resistance, and he's a member of the Scientific Committee of the Belgian uh, Federal Food Agency. Uh, and he's also been involved in the development of the Biocheck biosecurity scoring tool that many of you producers here in Ireland would be familiar with. So I will pass over now to, to Jerome, uh, but before I do, there's a question uh, option for yourselves there, those of you online, that you can put in your questions throughout the, the presentation, and my colleagues, Jeremy McCutcheon and, and Michael McKeown will facilitate the question and answer session at the end. So uh, over to you, Jerome. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the invitation of presenting here to you today this uh, webinar on biosecurity. Um, so I'll be talking about biosecurity in pig production and, and first of all I will introduce a bit on the principles of biosecurity since I think it's important to fully understand these, these principles of biosecurity and then secondly we'll, uh, we'll dig in into the effects of biosecurity and how you can apply uh, uh, biosecurity. So uh, before, before uh, starting uh, maybe just, just uh, a very brief uh, definition of what is biosecurity and uh, when we talk about biosecurity what do we understand on, uh, on that? Well it's a combination of all measures taken to reduce the risk of introduction and spread of infectious diseases at a certain level. It right? could be a farm level, the regional level, the country level or even a worldwide level um, with the current corona. Uh, you, you see biosecurity measures being taken at many many different levels uh, at, at the human uh, health uh, department, uh, but uh, it's a very comparable um, ID. I'll be focusing on biosecurity at the farm level, uh, so that that will be the focus of my of my talk. And as you can see from the definition, biosecurity actually contains two components: it's external biosecurity and internal biosecurity. And the external biosecurity is actually all the measures we take to try to prevent the introduction of pathogens into a farm. And at the same time also try to prevent the spread of pathogens from the farm to another farm. And so really it's trying to shield off your farm from the outside world. Um, and that's a component of biosecurity we probably are uh, familiar with already for the longest time, because that's a type of biosecurity which is introduced linked to uh, this, the, the threat of epidemic diseases. I would think about African swine fever these days. In the past, it was classical swine fever, fruit and mouth disease. In, in poultry production, we talk about avian influenza. All those uh, different diseases that come from outside uh, and that threaten the animals in the farm, uh, we try to prevent them by taking measures to avoid introduction. But there is a second component of biosecurity uh, which is often lesser well known, uh, and I'll, I'll show you some applications of that later on, uh, and which is the internal biosecurity. And the internal biosecurity is actually all measures you take to prevent or to reduce, and it's not always possible to prevent it 100%, but to reduce uh, as much as possible the spread of pathogens from one uh, age category of animals to the other, or from one compartment to the other compartment. So to avoid the recirculation or the spread of pathogens within the farm. This is not so much linked to these epidemic diseases as uh, obviously when a farm would get uh, uh, infected by, by African swine fever, we wouldn't try to limit it to one stable and, and keep the others, it would be eradication of a full stable. Um, sorry. However, when the, when we talk about endemic diseases, if we talk about 
uh, uh, post-weaning diarrhea, if we talk about streptococci infections, if we, if we talk about uh, parasitic infections, we, we probably never get fully rid of these pathogens at the farm. But the, the goal is to keep the infection pressure below a certain uh, threshold so that we can avoid the spread of the pathogens or limit the spread of the pathogens from one side to the other. So this internal biosecurity is equally as important. And especially, and we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later, when we think about antimicrobial usage, when we think about reducing antimicrobial usage, it's very important that we reduce this infection pressure. So linked to this antimicrobial usage issue, and this internal biosecurity has raised uh, enormously in its, in its uh, uh, importance. So I see biosecurity really as the fundament, as the basis of any disease control program. So it, it, I, I often refer or, or compare it to building a house. If you want to build a very nice and a very big house, and you do it on a very weak, a very narrow fundament, sooner or later it's going to collapse. And that's exactly the same with animal production. If you want to build a, a, a nice farm with, with good producing animals, uh, with strong growth, uh, good reproduction, and you do it on a very narrow basis in terms of disease prevention, sooner or later it's going to collapse. You're going to get introduction of diseases, you're going to get a lot of health problems. So this solid fundament, uh, the solid fundament is quite important, and that's what we do with biosecurity. On top of that, we add preventive measures, and, and typically preventive measures in pig production, and we refer to vaccines. And there's a plenty of vaccines available, good vaccines available, which we can apply in terms of, in, in relation to the uh, infections that are uh, threatening the animals in a certain uh, area or a certain farm. Um, but also these vaccines, they will work substantially better if you will apply them to farms where, the, where you have already good biosecurity. If you apply often expensive vaccines in very dirty farms, in farms where your management is poor, then it's going to be a waste of money also in the vaccines because they will not have their full capacity, their full uh, efficacy. If you, if you do it, on the contrary, in very well-managed farms, you probably will need lesser vaccines and the ones you're going to use, they're going to be much more effective. And if we do all of this good, the biosecurity, the preventive measures, we can limit to very much, to a very large extent, the curative use of medicines. Because whenever we have to treat an animal, actually we have already failed first time. And we have failed in a prevention. It's better to prevent diseases than to uh, let them happen and then later on treat for these uh, diseases. So that's the whole uh, uh, idea of this uh, uh, disease prevention. Uh, when, when I talk about prevention, I've talked about vaccines, of course, it also contains food additives, for instance, drink water additives, uh, and so on. So there's more in these preventive measures, uh, good, good feeding uh, as such is already a component of preventive measures, so it's not only uh, vaccines. Okay, why would we implement biosecurity? Well, there's a number of reasons. Better biosecurity uh, is believed to lead to less, lesser diseases. And if you have lesser diseases in your animals, you have better production results in terms of reproduction, in terms of growth, in terms of feed conversion, in terms of uniformity, uh, and so on. If you have lesser diseases, you need lesser antimicrobials. If you have lesser diseases and you have uh, more, uh, bigger, better uniformity for instance you can have higher prices when selling the animals what other reasons well biosecurity measures are often components of eradication programs for instance if you're trying to er eradicate salmonella if you're trying to eradicate uh, other uh, uh, infectious diseases uh, biosecurity is going to be a, an important component there is of course also this risk of exotic diseases and we've talked about african swine fever before um, well of course, uh, being on an island like Ireland, uh, it's a privileged situation uh, uh, compared to my country, for instance, in Belgium, where, where we are uh, the, the crossroad of, of many highways crossing through Europe, and therefore also a lot of risks related to it. But even on an island, diseases can come in 
uh, I think about the Futa Mao disease outbreak in, in the United Kingdom uh, around 20 years ago uh, with devastating uh, consequences. So also uh, these, these exotic diseases, uh, you, you may think they're gone, but they aren't. And then there's the public health, uh, animal welfare, public opinion. And it's, it's better to be able to show uh, nice and clean uh, farms uh, to the public opinion than, than dirty, uh, poorly managed farms. And sometimes uh, there's even components of biosecurity into the legislation. However, legislation is often is a follower, it's not a leader. Uh, so uh, uh, it's, it shouldn't be, legislation shouldn't be your, own moti your only uh, motivation to implement biosecurity measures. Uh, there is many more good arguments to implement biosecurity. Well, just think for a second about this list, about the, the, all these issues I've, I've, I've listed here. And I can presume, and I, I can't ask you if, you if you would be a live audience, I probably would ask you to vote, uh, but I can presume that there's a few people in the audience that disagree with what I've, what I've listed here. And they say, okay, this all uh, looks logic. And indeed, it looks logic and it sounds logical that better biosecurity leads to better production results, leads to lesser antimicrobial usage. However, when you dig into the scientific, scientific literature, and that's what, what we did uh, uh, almost 15 years ago for the first time, we start to search for publications, scientific publications that supported these statements. And to our surprise, we found out that there were very few. Uh, everybody agrees that better biosecurity leads to lesser uh, disease or better health. However, never, nobody had ever shown it. Nobody had ever quantified this effect. Uh, and that is actually the starter of our research. This is a starter of 15 years ago of, 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 of the, the interest of my research team into the topic of biosecurity, where we said, well, let's try to prove this. Let's try to show these effects, uh, whether they, or, or at least uh, uh, investigate whether the, these effects are really present or not. And to be able to do so, the first thing we needed to, be, to do is to measure biosecurity, uh, to quantify biosecurity. And that was actually uh, the start of the development of the biocheck system, which I'll, I'll explain you in a minute. And uh, as already said in the introduction, many of you are uh, familiar with them. So we uh, will, uh, uh, I'll come back uh, to that later. But just remember, there's a lot of things linked to biosecurity. Uh, and in the past, few of them were proven. Today, uh, unfortunately, 15 years later, uh, uh, a lot has evolved. Uh, and we've, we've done a lot of work of research within our research group. But, but for sure, we're not the only one. Several of many different research groups throughout the world have done comparable types of work or complementary, complementary types of work and, and found very nice outcomes which I'll share with you. Before going to those results, I want to uh, dig into the principles of biosecurity. And actually the principles of biosecurity, they're quite simple. And there's five principles I want to share with you. And my first principle is the idea that uh, would whatever biosecurity measure we'll take, it always aims at separating infectious and susceptible animals. At one side, we have infectious or potentially infectious animals, and on the other side, we have susceptible animals, and we try to avoid that both come into contact with each other. And throughout my talk, when I talk about biosecurity, you're probably going to recognize enormous amount of things what we are currently doing with corona when we talk about putting on uh, masks uh, well it's exactly the same thing we try to separate in potentially infectious animals from susceptible animals and we try to break those transmission uh, from the one to the other well with biosecurity measures that's what we've trying to be do uh, already for 20 years uh, so uh, in veterinary medicine or in animal production we were maybe a little bit ahead of what they start to learn now in, uh, in human medicine. It's a bit uh, exaggerated, of course, but yeah, I think you see the point. Well, when we try to separate infectious and susceptible animals, there's actually two things we want to do. There's two ways of transmitting diseases. There is one, which is the direct contact, and there's the other, which is the indirect contact. 
And it's important to understand that transmitting infectious diseases through direct contact is always more if, if he, uh, efficacious and more important and more easy to transmit pathogens by direct contact than to do it through indirect contact. So whenever you have to rank, and I'll come back to that, whenever you have to rank by security measures, you'll put the measures that avoid direct contact between infectious and susceptible animals higher than the measures that prevent indirect contact. On the other hand, these indirect contacts, they may be lesser efficient, but they are repeated very frequently. We go in and out to the farms of the stables, and we have contacts, we have food deliveries, we have water uh, coming into the stables, and so on. So all these indirect transmissions, each of them, each unique event, is maybe not that if efficacious in transmitting a pathogen. However, if you, if you continue to repeat them, at the end, they become dangerous as well. And so that's why we have to tackle both. We have to try to prevent the direct contacts and we have to try to prevent the indirect contacts. Yet, unfortunately, and so, so what we try to do here, what we try to do here is we try to build a wall between uh, the susceptible animals and the potentially infectious animals. Huh? So, or we could compare it to a dirty part and a clean part. Uh, and we try to separate the dirty and the clean part. Could also be the slaughterhouse and the, and the farm. And that could also be seen as a potential infectious area and a, and a clean area. So we try to build a wall in between. However, unfortunately, that wall cannot be 100%. And we can breed pigs without ever visiting the pig farms or visiting the stables. And we can breed pigs without bringing water uh, to the animals, without bringing feed to the animals, without uh, have bringing in a transport truck once in a while. However, so whenever we cross uh, that line, we have to take measures. That's the whole idea, and we have to take measures. And those measures are the biosecurity uh, measures, and there are uh, many of them, of course. Which measures we have to take will largely depend on your specific herd situation. And every herd is different. Every farm is different. And therefore, uh, the, the ranking, the importance of the measures to be taken on your specific farm will be different than the ones you have to take on your neighbor's farm. And that's why you'll, you will not get from me a top 10 list of the most important biosecurity measures. Uh, I can give you a top 100 list of all important biosecurity measures, but the ones you will have to uh, implement, and will, the ones that are most importantly in your specific situation, will typically depend on what is already there, how your farm is built, uh, and, and therefore we have tools uh, to make uh, the, the uh, advice herd specific. Secondly, uh, what is important uh, when thinking about biosecurity measures is that taking a measure is not a one-time event. It's really something you have to repeat over and over again. Therefore, biosecurity is an attitude. It's not something you do once uh, and uh, do some changes in your farm and then you say it's over and done with and my biosecurity is now uh, uh, perfectly in order. No, it's something you have to do every day again over and over. So really, biosecurity is an attitude. And that's an important insight. It's quite obvious, but it's important, especially for those people that try to advise farmers on biosecurity. Because sometimes, uh, after advising, they don't immediately will follow up on your advices. You have to realize that you try to change the attitude of people and changing the attitude of people, that takes time. It's very comparable to advise people to stop smoking. We all know that smoking is not healthy and still there's a lot of people that are smoking. Before we'll get everybody to stop to smoke, it will take us a lot of time and we can't lose or we shouldn't lose motivation after our first advice. After we said once you, should, you better stop smoking, and if the next day they continue to smoke, we'll say, well, I've done my job, I've given my advice, uh, and I, I, I won't come back on it. No, eh? when, when you want people to change their attitude, you have to work on it for a long time. Okay, well, what is important also is that we have to realize that different diseases have different 
routes of transmission. And you may recognize here a lot of uh, big diseases in the left side. And then you also have here different transmission routes uh, through people, through semen, uh, through domestic animals, uh, and so on. I, I'm not going to go into detail in every disease, of course, but I just want to show you this. First of all, showing that most of the diseases are transmitted through direct contact. That's why that's so important. And secondly, also showing uh, that, that other transmission routes are uh, more or less uh, important or some are more important than others. That's something we're going to take into account. If you want to see the whole list, they're all listed in, in, in this book, uh, which we wrote on it uh, for, for different species, and not only for pigs, also for cattle and, and poultry. Uh, but we've, we've taken all these transmission routes and the relative importance of the transmission routes to rank uh, the biosecurity measures. And that's uh, the second principle. Not every transmission route is equally as important. Direct contact, bringing in live animals, for instance, buying animals, is of a high risk. <laughs> Whereas persons, persons bred, uh, people coming in that have done all the necessary hygiene measures, such as washing your hands, changing clothes and footwear, and still the risk of having a pathogen uh, present in their nose uh, somewhere, uh, and that could potentially be transmitted, that's a very low risk. And there's a lot of things in between. So when you take by security measures, it's important to rank the measures and to focus on the important ones first and only secondly go to the lesser important one. And again, this, this looks extremely logical, but you see enormous mistakes in this. Uh, plenty of people saying, well, when we have visitors, they have to be 24 hours pig free or 48 hours pig free before they're allowed to come into the stables. Okay, that's nice. On my list of biosecurity measures, that has a, a priority number 100. Buying animals and having a good quarantine stable, that's where I see plenty of mistakes, whereas that is on my priority list on number one or two uh, uh, in terms of importance. So really put your money, put your effort where it really matters and not so much or only later on on those tiny uh, uh, effects. Third principle, and I've uh, talked about that already a little bit in the introduction, is that it's taken by security measures is also not black and white. It's not about we're going to eliminate every pathogen on the farm. It's never going to work. Right? We're never going to be able to breed pigs at least not in the, near, uh, in the, in the next 50 years, uh, to breed pigs without having any E. coli, for instance, uh, in the gut of these pigs. But we will be able, and we are already able today, to keep the infection load below a certain threshold where the animal's immunity can cope with it. So we have to reduce the burden on the immune system and by, having a, a li by limiting the infection pressure. So therefore, when you take biosecurity measures, and then in this, uh, we're we'll talking a lot about cleaning and disinfection, for instance, and many of the internal biosecurity measures, when you take those measures, every measure you take is an additional step. So sometimes people, when, when we give advice on biosecurity, we get the feedback from the farmers, I can do all of those measures, and therefore I will do none. Well, that's not a good idea. And when I would suggest you thin biosecurity measures, and for some reason or another, it's not possible to do all of them. Well, if you can already implement five out of the 10, you have made a big uh, uh, step forward. So don't look at it black and white, take a step by step and go stepwise uh, uh, towards an improved uh, biosecurity. Because every step you take, you'll get a limited reduction of the infection pressure uh, and that will help the animals uh, to, to cope with the, with the infectious uh, agents. Fourth principle, uh, and that's a, a question for you to think about. Where do you believe is biosecurity most important? Is it most important in large herds, in small herds, or is it independent of the herd size? Whatever herd size you have, biosecurity is always important. Again, I want to ask you to vote, but you all have thought about an answer for yourself. Well, look at this. If you were a goalkeeper, which would be the goal that is the most easy to defend. 
Well, and if you see the, you clearly already see the comparison and then you also have the answer on my previous question. If your farm is quite small, it is like a small goal. The probability that something will hit, uh, will come in, is much smaller and therefore it's more easy to guard than such a big farm. And why is that? Because big farms have more contacts, you have more frequently transport trucks coming in with feed or with animals, you have more frequently professional visitors such as the veterinarian or other advisors come into your farm. And secondly, once a pathogen gets in, there is just more animals present that will allow an internal spread, an internal buildup of infection pressure within your farm. If you have a very small farm, a pathogen can come in and by by chance, by luck, it will die, it could die out in the very early phases of the spread. In a large farm, that won't happen. So the probability of something coming in is higher, and the consequences of when it guts in are much bigger. Therefore, when you have a bigger farm, you need to be more vigilant. You need to take more biosecurity measures. And that's exactly why biosecurity is more important today than it was 20 years ago. And it's likely to become more important in the future uh, as farms just increase in, in their size. It's also something farmers sometimes don't fully understand. Uh, we often get the feedback and when we advise on biosecurity that the farmer says, well, I've been doing it like that for 20 years and it always went fine. Why should I change? The answer is often because your farm today is twice or, or three times or four times as large as it was 20 years ago. And therefore you can't uh, allow yourself anymore uh, these biosecurity mistakes which you could uh, have in the, in the past. So size really matters. The bigger your farm is, the more important your biosecurity becomes. Final principle is the fifth one. And again, I'll introduce that with a question. Assume that the risk of disease introduction on your herd to a feed delivery truck is one out of thousands. So that's 0.1% estimated as a small risk. And the feed delivery truck comes weekly. What is then the annual risk at the end of the year? How big is the risk? Well, the answer is here. The answer is 5%. Uh, you go from a one out of thousand chance to become infected through this transport truck to one out of 20 percent uh, one out of 20 chance to become infected which is because it's already more important and that's simply due to this frequency of repetition what i mentioned already before even in important transmission routes if you repeat them very frequently they become important at the end and that's also important for the farmers themselves, because if you, as a farmer, uh, the things you do daily, you will automatically feel as being low risk because you do them every day and, and nothing goes wrong or you don't see anything going wrong. Whereas it should be the other way around. The things you do, should, you do daily, you should treat with a lot of attention because since, since the fact that you do them daily, they become uh, important and they become risky. So all of this to tell you, uh, um, all of these are the principles of biosecurity and those are the principles also implemented in this biocheck system, which many of you will be familiar with uh, and those that aren't, uh, I, I truly uh, um, motivate you, uh, uh, suggest you to use the biocheck system to evaluate your biosecurity and to find out your strong and weak parts of your farm. So whenever you filled in this questionnaire, you'll get a report like this with your own score, uh, which is compared to a certain country average, uh, the I Irish average in your situation, and the global average. Whenever your score is in red, it means that you are below uh, your country average. And it means that there is some margin for improvement. And that is really, uh, when I talked about these farm-specific advices, that is really where you start to give advices. You can see this specific farm scoring quite uh, poorly on feed, water, and equipment supply. Well, there's some things to be improved there. And maybe water quality should be checked more frequently. And uh, maybe the, the feed delivery truck 
comes too close to the farm or the, or the driver has access to the stables or uh, should dig in a bit more to the specific farm to find out what is the problem. But there's certainly a number of things we can improve uh, in, uh, with that uh, regard in this farm. Well, and if I look at the Irish data, and they, these are uh, data based on, on around 200 uh, Irish pig farms, um, uh, recent, recent data, and so maybe it represents some of your farms here. Well, then you can see that there's a number uh, of things done very well in Ireland. Uh, purchase of breeding pigs, piglins, and semen, very high score, and that's, uh, as I understood, is linked to the fact that there's very few people that are buying animals. Right? Most of you will breed the animals on the farm. Very good idea because that's reducing the risks of disease spread already to a large extent. So really very, very good uh, because that's an important one. Also quite high scores on the location of the farm. That's due to the link, link to the fact that the intensity of farming, of pig farming in Ireland is not as as high as it is, for instance, in Belgium or the Netherlands or Denmark, which is again an advantage. If your if your nearest neighbor is not a three, a two or three hundred meters away from you, but is more like a couple of kilometers away from you, that's an advantage. But then there's also a few things that done uh, where there's a lot of margin for improvement. Again, the feed, water, and equipment supply. Talked about that. Uh, often that scores quite poorly, and that's where you can easily make improvements but also visitors and farm workers, uh, uh, people coming into the farm and the measures you take to with that extent. Well, I'm not going to go into detail in all those measures. I don't have time to explain all of them, but just mention that on the biochecker, we have this newsletter. So we, we send newsletters every two to three months. And our latest newsletter was on entrance control. And so it's a one page newsletter. Uh, and if you, if you go into the newsletter, uh, you get some guidelines uh, on when people enter your farm, what are the things you should do at least uh, to, to, to avoid that pathogens uh, come in. Uh, uh, and in these corona days, uh, it's even a better idea than it was already before uh, to take good care on, on uh, entrance control measures. We also have the internal biosecurity. As I said before, intel bi internal biosecurity often scores a bit lower than external biosecurity. And again, a number of things are done quite good. So disease management, uh, the measures taken in the finishing units are quite well in, in Ireland on average. Whereas a number of other things uh, in the firing and circling period, uh, in the nursery unit, uh, and the measures between the compartments, especially the latest one, uh, which is important, the spreading and uh, uh, separating the age groups uh, to avoid spread from pathogens from one age group and uh, from older animals to the younger so often. Um, uh, there is a lot of improvement uh, possible. So how do we work with all of this? Well, uh, the way we work uh, is what we call check, improve and reduce. Uh, and that is a, a simple and effective approach. And where is it? The first thing what we do and uh, when we come to a farm and when we want to uh, improve the situation and reduce the antimicrobial usage is to check. We do the bio check, we check the uh, situation, uh, wh what, what is going on in the farm. Secondly, we're going to try to improve the situation by right? uh, advising on biosecurity, improving the things. Sometimes uh, we might also need to improve on the vaccination schemes. Uh, we might uh, need to improve on, on, the, on the feeding uh, um, schemes. Uh, so it's not only biosecurity. That's an important uh, side comment I want to make as well. Uh, biosecurity is not the golden bullet. It's not the thing that's going to solve everything. Uh, heading towards good health, uh, the next level in animal production, biosecurity is a very important component, but it's not the only component. It's also feed, it's also genetics, it's, a, it, it's housing uh, and so on. Uh, but uh, so we want to improve on biosecurity and on other things and only then we go for reduction in antimicrobial usage don't mix up the order of actions because if you first start to reduce the antimicrobial usage and then later on we'll uh, try to learn how your biosecurity situation is and maybe uh, improve a few things then uh, the likelihood that it goes wrong is quite high so you first need to improve the situation and then you can allow yourself to reduce the antimicrobial usage because 
you don't need it anymore because you, your disease prevention, your infection prevention has improved a lot. So we aim for herd specific advices. Uh, I've mentioned that before uh, be, because there is an, uh, um, yeah, the, the, your uh, farms are all different uh, and therefore uh, the type of advice you have to give is typical, should be herd specific. If you make it a very generic advice, it won't talk to people. It won't talk to people so much than whether it is a really herd specific advice. And just to show you, and I come to the last, uh, last part of my presentation, what all of this and uh, this approach of check, improve and reduce, what that can result in. Uh, and to show you this, I'm going to discuss a, a study we've conducted already a couple of years ago where we try to reduce the antimicrobial usage uh, through coaching of pig farms, uh, coaching by improving biosecurity and improving uh, uh, animal health and management, uh, and then try to reduce the antimicrobial usage. And we also looked at the production results because at the end of the day, we know, uh, and that's quite logic, and that the farmers uh, want to gain uh, their life with keeping animals. Uh, so production is important. Uh, it, it's quite easy to say you have to reduce antimicrobial usage, and if that jeopardizes your production, I don't care because I'm only interested in the antimicrobial usage. Well, that's not the way forward. The way forward is reducing antimicrobial usage without jeopardizing your production results. And uh, we do that through coaching. What is important about coaching is that there is a difference between coaching and advising. Advising is typically a one-way directional uh, uh, action. I'm the expert and I tell you what to do because uh, I advise you that you should vaccinate or not vaccinate, you should uh, uh, clean or disinfect or it should change here or something. Else. That is uh, advice. Coaching is a dialogue. It's, there is a, a coach that brings in a few ideas. There is a farmer, there is the herd veterinarian, maybe the feed advisor, uh, all people that are related to the farm and have an impact on, on the animal health. They also have ideas and we bring all those ideas together. And we look at the efficacy uh, of the measures, but also at the feasibility, at the costs of the measures. And based on all those ideas together, we decide upon a number of things to uh, uh, improve. And the coach, whoever it is, often it's a, it's a herd veterinarian, uh, but can, can be anybody who takes on the role of the coach, uh, can then motivate all uh, involved people to really implement the changes. Because again, referring to the idea that you have to change an attitude, it takes a bit of time. It's not simply listing up, uh, 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 sitting together for one hour on the kitchen table and then decide, oh, this is what we're gonna do. So now it's all done. No, no, it's only the first step. You decide uh, your plan, but then you need to follow up on whether it's really uh, done. So we've done that on 60 farms in Belgium, uh, 60 pig farms in Belgium. And we give advices on biosecurity and management uh, such as uh, register which symptoms you have and, and the moment of mortality just to know exactly what is going on on your farm. Analyze the drink water uh, uh, and that was advised often and it was also implemented. Uh, you see in the level of implementation so it was also implemented by the farms so those were good advices I, I, I assume, and especially feasible advices. Also hand hygiene, uh, uh, changing of needles uh, and so on. I'm not gonna discuss them all in detail. It would take me much more time to, to give a full presentation on, on all the biosecurity measures, uh, but it, it gives you an idea. We also showed that there's a number of, of advices we give, uh, what we gave in the past, that were not very successful in their implementation. Uh, we advised on many farms to have a hygiene lock per animal uh, age, or age category. Uh, and some said, okay, we're gonna do, but at the end, very few did it. We advise to keep the dog and the cat outside of the stable. Uh, we often advise it. Some say they're gonna do, at the end, very few will do it. And so it means, and, and that's important, not every biosecurity measure will, will, can and will be followed up. It's not necessarily an extreme problem. As long as you make steps forward uh, and you can make, and every farm, uh, you have different things uh, which you can implement, 
more easy or lesser uh, easily. We also advised on vaccination and diagnostics, uh, uh, and even more on diagnostics than on, on vaccination, to know exactly what is going on into your farm. And uh, farmers uh, followed us. Uh, and then uh, we said, okay, if you do all of this, uh, you have to uh, uh, reduce on your uh, antimicrobial usage. Uh, uh, restrict the use of these very potent antimicrobials, uh, the, the, the third generation of antimicrobials. Stop the routine prophylactic treatment uh, of birth until slaughter. Uh, this, and especially this routine treatment, prophylactic treatment, uh, is a type of antimicrobial usage where you can make big uh, uh, improvements. And uh, stop prophylactic treatment of the sows as well. And, and then ask for resistant profile sensitivity testing. Um, yeah. That's, that's the kind of thing where we stopped advising and because nobody really uh, does that. Again, her specific advices, what did it result in? Well, uh, that's the antimicrobial usage. Uh, the first is the antimicrobial usage. Before we start of the, of, the, of the study, the second is after. In the piglets, we could reduce with around 46%. In the finishers, with around 82%. Uh, and bringing those two together, uh, we have a reduction of minus 52% in antimicrobial usage. And that was done in a time frame of around one year. And so approaching those farms and visiting them three to four times, uh, measuring the situation, advising or coaching uh, on, on, uh, on improvements, follow up on these improvements and then see what, what the effects are. And also in the south, uh, we had a reduction of around 32%. So quite, spectacular reductions in antimicrobial usage and then many of you probably think well that must must be a disaster in terms of production in, on those farms well at the same time we looked at the production results the number of wheat piglets per sow per year went up the daily weight gain in the finishers it went up the mortality in the finishing period reduced yeah? so lesser antimicrobials and still lesser uh, mortality so it's a one idea, living in the head of many people, that you need antimicrobials to get healthy animals. On the contrary, there's plenty of studies showing that the more antimicrobials that are used on a farm, the worse the animal health is on this farm. And that's not causal, not necessarily causal. Often it's the bad animal health that are, is, uh, is resulting in, in high antimicrobial usage. But with this high antimicrobial usage, you don't solve the problem. You just make, con, maintain the problem uh, um, and it never gets solved. Improving the biosecurity, improving the prevention, uh, solves the problem at the root and gives you a much better long-term perspective. So antimicrobial usage reduced. In fact, production parameters improved, not dramatically, but they did improve, uh, to, uh, uh, and some of them improved significantly. The others, I just stayed uh, uh, the same. And when we bring all of this together into an economic evaluation, uh, we found out that in this study on the left side here, and that's the results of the study I've just shown you, and that the farms that followed up on this coaching uh, had a positive benefit, a positive economic benefit uh, due to uh, improvement in the biosecurity. Biosecurity has some costs, often the quite limited cost is not very uh, expensive, but uh, we have also the benefits. Benefits are with lesser, uh, you, you don't have to pay for the antibiotics since you don't use that or you use them less to a lesser extent. And especially benefits in terms of production, uh, your better production. Later on, we've repeated this study in, in two different countries, in Belgium and in France. And also here you see that an average and we have a quite big improvement, uh, quite good improvement uh, of, the, uh, of the rentability uh, of the farms. So uh, it shows, uh, based on scientific uh, research, that in investing into biosecurity pays off um, in terms of, of health and in terms of uh, uh, production results. So it's a really win, win, win. It's a win for the animal health. It's a win for the human health. And it's a win for the, for the farmers, for the farmers' financial health, uh, I would say. So by, by improving this biosecurity, you really can uh, 
result in big uh, improvements uh, here in terms of reducing antimicrobial usage and therefore also uh, reducing uh, antimicrobial resistance, of course. I want to thank you very much for your attention. If you want to know more about all of what I've talked about, I've, I've written a couple of books on it. So if, if you're interested in it, you can always contact me uh, and I'll, I'm happy to share a more detailed uh, information. And with this, I want to finalize and I want to open up for the questions. So thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, Jerome. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. Lots of, lots of useful, very useful practical information in there as well. Um, so just remind you there uh, to the audience uh, um, that are logged in that you can put in your questions. Uh, you can type in your questions there under the Q&A uh, option at the bottom of your screen on your computer or laptop. Um, so if you want to put in some questions there. Um, in the meantime, uh, Ger and Michael, we'll maybe start with Ger. Ger, a few, uh, some questions there. Yeah, just, just one, one question that came in there, Jerome, as you were speaking was, have you any specific um, biosecurity measures that you would recommend for the control of APP, Actinobacillus uh, pleuropneumonia? Um, well, I don't have any specific measure for APP. I mean, APP is, uh, is, a, is, is, is a problem, uh, again, often linked to this infection pressure. It's present on many farms, the, the pathogen is present on many farms, but doesn't always uh, result into uh, diseases. So that is, uh, uh, it has to do with, with general hygiene, uh, the, the cleaning and disinfection measures between compartments, so the age groups between compartments, uh, keep them separated, uh, is important in relation to uh, APP. Um, but yeah, it's generally, it's kind of hard to, 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 to have for one specific pathogen, one specific uh, measure that, that will do the trick. It's mostly a combination of, uh, of measures. So the uh, good all in allowed on your, in, in your fattening unit, for instance, a good cleaning and disinfection between uh, the repeated uh, components, uh, between the repeated production rounds in, in the fattening unit. Uh, and so on, all of those are important measures here. Thank you. Okay. Michael, have you any questions there? Yeah, uh, just two questions that came to mind as, as you're speaking, Jerome. One is that a lot of units have foot bats outside doors, and in fairness, they're trying to make an effort for the internal security, uh, the biosecurity. Um, now, how, but, if the footpaths obviously aren't aren't washed out and replenished on a regular basis, you're probably uh, the effect of it is quite small. I was just wondering what would your advice be? How often do they have to be replenished, cleaned out, um, for it to be an effective system? Yeah, well, good point. Good point. Well, the footpaths, um, these disinfecting footpaths, I often call them infection bots. Because um, you really very, very often see them being used wrongly. And therefore, I'm not the biggest fan of these disinfection food bots. Uh, I, I like much more that people use farm specific footwear. If a visitor, if a veterinarian, whoever comes to the farm, doesn't, don't use your own boots, but use boots from the farm that will never go anywhere else. That's the first point. Uh, and, um, uh, secondly, if you use food baths, there's a number of things that are important. Water should be clean. You should have a sufficient concentration of disinfectant product in the water. And the temperature should be high enough. So the, the um, effect of your disinfection is a combination of the contact time of your disinfected product, as a combination of the concentration of your product, the contact time, the duration of you standing in, in the disinfection bath, and um, the temperature. The colder it is, the longer your contact time has to be. The lower your concentration is, the higher your contact, or the longer your contact time has to be. In an ideal situation, you know, where the water is clean, you have sufficient high concentration, and the temperature is above 15 degrees, you still should be for two minutes in, into the food box. So I, hard, I, I, I don't think many people do that. Uh, you, you, you generally uh, dip your, your shoes for a few seconds into the food bath and then you think they're totally uh, disinfected, which they aren't. So it's much better to have 
places where after you use the farm specific boots, you put your boots in and, and the boots can stay in a disinfection bath, not for a few minutes, but probably for a few hours, right? overnight for instance. And then you will have a, a, a good and a sufficient uh, uh, disinfection. So just the food bonds, you have to be careful with them because they give you a false feeling yep. of, uh, of security, uh, and, and which is not the case unless you really use them very good. In terms of uh, uh, changing over, well, at least uh, every two days uh, you have to refresh uh, your food bond. And whenever there is dirt in there, because uh, 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 the dirt, uh, mud, uh, whatever, uh, will react with your disinfection, it's organic, uh, whatever organic material that you put into your, in your disinfection bath, will react with your disinfection product and will reduce the effects, efficacy of your disinfection product. So if you have a dirty food bath, uh, even if your concentration of disinfectant product is, is high enough, it still uh, will not have a, have sufficient good effects. So does that mean effectively there's no point having a boot wash, a, 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 sorry, a, a disinfectant unless you have a boot wash beside it, that you're washing the boots first with a boot wash and then you're using a disinfectant. And the second thing is, if you're using a disinfectant, then ideally you'd need it inside, just inside the door where the temperature, room temperature is probably 20 degrees plus, as opposed to where most units have it outside the door in the cold. Yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, two points, very good points. The boot washer, uh, you can't disinfect dirty surfaces. Uh, and that's, that's true for, for boots. That's true for, uh, for if you want to wash, uh, clean and wash your, your, uh, your stables. If you don't wash them first, your disinfection is totally useless. That's also with boots. Uh, you first have to wash your boots with a boot washer. And then secondly, disinfect them. And you uh, better do it. Uh, where the, the temperature is high enough. And could I just ask you one last question? Um, the washing of sows going into a foreign house, is that a good thing for an internal biosecurity in that you're trying to break the link between the, say, Staphylococcus or whatever is going through the sow herd and then moving on to the growing herd? Is the, have you any advice on that? Yeah, um, washing of sows is a good idea. The only uh, point of attention here is that you have to have to look careful into where you do that. Uh, sometimes people first move the move the sows to the firing crates and then wash them in the firing crates, and that's not a good idea, because then you are uh, so if you first clean and disinfect your firing crates, then you bring in dirty animals, you wash the animals, uh, but again you have in, in that situation you have recontaminated your environment. And so ideally is that you do a cleaning and disinfection of your farrowing units and in between moving the sows from the, from the gestation stable towards uh, the farrowing units, in between you should uh, wash them. And so in a separate area you should wash them and then so that they can come in clean into the uh, farrowing crates. Okay, very good. Just uh, if I may ask a question then, in relation to your presentation, Jerome, you spoke about the hygiene lock for various categories of pigs. Can you explain just what you mean by that? Yeah, so a hygiene lock is, what is, is, is a place which you can use to change your clothes and footwear, wash your hands before you go into the stables. So, so uh, when for visitors entering, this, entering the stables, there's three main things you have to do. Uh, you have to change your footwear, uh, as, as I explained before, uh, preferably put on herd specific boots. Uh, you have to change your clothes, preferably put on herd specific clothes, a coverall, uh, and you have, have to wash your hands. Those are the three golden rules when going into a farm. Um, of these, if you can do that in a, in a hygiene lock, uh, the advantage is that there is a dedicated place uh, to change your clothes and change your footwear. And an ideal hygiene lock is also separated into a dirty area where you come in, where you put your own shoes, you put your own clothes, and then you move, uh, for instance, by crossing a certain, or by going, stepping over a bench, uh, move to the clean area, and there you put on 
uh, the herd specific footwear and clothes uh, and, and, and you can move further. And so making this distinction between the dirty and the clean area, it gives the advantage that, that you will have lesser crossing uh, of pathogens from one side to the other. Okay, and would that apply, say, within the farm then from various sections, say from the farrowing house to the wiener section or the wiener section to the finisher section? Yeah, well, that's all the, already at the second level. So uh, what I just explained, you should do it certainly when you come into the farm and before you go to uh, the first animal category. Secondly, it's also good to take comparable measures between each age category. Right? It's already a bit more difficult, of course, to do that, uh, but you can have built or create small um, hygiene locks between each age category. And then again, and when you go from the, uh, from, from, from the farrowing units, for instance, to the nursery unit, uh, you change footwear, you change uh, overalls, you quickly wash and disinfect your hands and you, do, you go to the next step. In this, it's also important that we always try to work from young to old. So we start with the youngest animals and then you work your way up towards the oldest animals. And if I may ask one last question, in terms of power washing, where you, you clean the farrowing house um, and empty out all the, all the animals power wash it and disinfect it, would you, would you have any recommendations there in terms of the length of time to dry that between disinfection or what, what uh, recommendations would you have in that regard? Yes, well, a good cleaning and disinfection protocol contains seven steps. So the first one is to remove all the organic material, a dry, a dry wash, mm. remove the, the main organic. Second is, is a soaking step, where you soak the environment so that, that the organic material can loose. Third step is then the power washer, where you with high pressure, will remove the organic material. If you've done a soaking step, if you've done that well, the high pressure will go much faster. So you will gain again the time you lost in the second step, you'll gain over and over in the, in the, third, in the third step. So that's a very, uh, a very good uh, thing. Um, the fourth step then, and that's a very important one, is a drying step. So never start disinfect a, a wet surface. So you, after you're cleaning, you have to dry your surface and only in the fifth step, you're gonna disinfect. And why is that? If you disinfect already on a wet surface, you'll get the dilution of your disinfectant. Because if, if your surface is wet, it means that there is still a small layer of water. And, and if you then add your disinfectant, then your disinfectant will actually be diluted in this layer of water. And one millimeter of water on, an, on a square meter, it, that represents one liter of water. And so you, you quickly have a very important dilution and you will have a reduction of your efficacy of your disinfectant. So first, after washing, have it dried. And how long that takes really depends on the situation, whether you heat it or not, and so on. But first have it dry, and when it's dry, then you can start to do your disinfectant, disinfection. After your disinfection, there is another step of drying, uh, and then the last step in an ideal world is that you also do a testing, yeah, that you test it, take uh, some samples to test whether your cleaning and disinfection was, uh, was efficacious. Okay. Thank you. Can I ask you um, a related question that you're on? If you're going to the slaughter plant and you may be using the same truck, it's your truck, but you might be doing a, a two loads within the one day. So you're going to the slaughter plant, unloading your pigs, you're washing the truck, you're coming back to your unit and you're loading up a second time and, and you're going to the factory. Obviously, it's not the ideal thing uh, in, uh, from a biosecurity point of view, but where you're washing the truck and you're flush washing the truck, uh, so simply you're washing out the solid material out of the truck and you might be giving it a quick disinfectant. What's your view on that? I'll, I think that's a dangerous uh, a protocol because the, the simple washing or the flush washing isn't sufficient. It's helpful. It's better than doing nothing, that's for sure. But uh, uh, in, for, for a number of pathogens, I think about uh, dysenteria, for instance, uh, which is uh, 
could, could spread that way, it's not going to be sufficient. So it really would need the same protocol, which I mentioned for, for stables. Uh, you also need on a truck in terms of truck should be dry before you start to uh, disinfect, to have an efficacious disinfection. We've done a study, a recent study in Belgium where we sampled the tires of trucks coming from the slaughterhouse, and that was from pig slaughterhouses. Mm -hmm. There were trucks that were cleaned and disinfected at the slaughterhouse. Afterwards, we sampled the tires, the tires of the trucks, and on 50% of the trucks, we could retrieve camp pylobacter on the tires, uh, which is then a pathogen uh, yeah. that can be introduced into a broader production system. So if that's the case for uh, for, for broilers, it's, it's also going to be the case uh, for prick production. And so it's really something uh, yeah, you have to take into account and you have to be uh, uh, careful with. So are you saying then that, strictly speaking, if you're washing your truck, you need to have a drying system there before you disinfect it, before you can get pigs back on, on, onto that truck in, 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 yeah. a, in an ideal yeah. situation? Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. The alternative would be that you wash your truck, you drive towards your uh, uh, destination and before you get into the destination you do your disinfection so that maybe in the meantime you can gain some time with not have to stand there and wait all the time but but you need to have it dry before you start to disinfect it and if you're washing two trucks beside each other at the slaughter plant is the spray an issue yes the aerosol yes yeah it certainly is i mean uh, when you you create Aerosols, especially if you wash at a high pressure, uh, you create aerosols, and those aerosols are the perfect um, carriers of, of the pathogens that, that can be spread um, yeah, towards uh, okay. the, the, the next truck. And that's, that's, that's the corona story as well. Eh? It's when, when you sneeze, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's aerosols. And the aerosols are not a problem, but the aerosols are the carriers of the virus. And that's when you do cleaning disinfection, it's the same story. So that goes back to your point. Maybe if you do two loads in one day, you can do the flush wash at the factory, but then have, an, have another destination where you can do the thorough wash and dry and then go back to the factory or then go back to your pig unit then if you need to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks very much, Jerome uh, and Michael and Jared there. Um, I hope you found value there in the questions and answer session, but uh, we've just passed our hour, so we'd like to keep to time, so we're going to finish up. Before I do, I'd just like to thank our guest speaker once again, Jerome DeWolf. Uh, Jerome, we really appreciate your time here today, and all going well with, with the, the Lean project that we have ongoing here. Uh, we'd hope to have you working with us as part of that project maybe uh, in 2021. Um, but thanks again for your presentation today. I found it very useful, very informative. Thanks also to Jer and Michael for facilitating the questions. Uh, to Michelle Lavelle in the Chagas Connect Aid office uh, who uh, hosts the, the webinars on their platform. And as always to Alison Maloney in Chagas PR. Um, so I'd like to thank you yourselves for, for tuning in today. I hope you found it of benefit. Uh, and just to remind you that our next webinar uh, will be in a fortnight's time, that's two weeks, on the 24th of July, where Pat Lawler uh, from our own Chagas Pig Development Department will talk about the wean pig nutrition. Uh, so look forward to hearing from you all then and thanks for your attendance today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, Jerome. Thank you.